All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick, recording late Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we're going to do an AMA show today. Uh, we'll talk about uh, a lot of basketball, some tennis, uh, and some other random stuff. And then we'll talk about the Stanley Cup at the end uh, as we're recording some ridiculous Champions League games going on at the moment. There were what, five goals in the first 15 minutes um, of the two games combined as we uh, currently speak. Both of the English teams are losing 2-1, um, which is interesting. We'll break down the repercussions of that at some point, but let's get started here, Drew. Uh, question from at the Mel Insiders. Are you hedging any NAS read bets mm. currently? Uh, what's your read on this market? This one is really tricky because... Uh, the Nas performances lately have been loud <laughs> and they have yeah. been echoing around, uh, the, uh, Twitter sphere, the, you know, the, the, you, you know, you, you know, who got the homework assignment is, uh, the Timberwolves, uh, PR department. Uh, they got the assignment. They're, they're performing their job spectacularly. Um, and so the momentum does feel real. If you're just a casual observer, if you're trying to understand this market, um, and then you hear from most people that they're like, yeah, I mean, he, he was a deserving candidate before uh, he has gotten this shine. And in, and really, this will come down to um, how much is there a spirit of the of the award nitpicking over the fact that he is doing all of this while starting as an injured you know, replacement, injury replacement. And Carl Anthony Towns will be back before the end of the season, it sounds like, but not in you know, with enough time to uh, really make any type of difference. So um, I think that uh, the voters are going to be left with this question. Uh, and, you know, and some of it may be colored by ultimately how does how do the T-Wolves land? If the T-Wolves are the one seed, like, you know, this has to be all Nas, right? Like that, that has to help buoy his case uh, just because of his particular contributions down the stretch here. Um, but, you know, if they're the two seed, which seems more likely, uh, then there's going to be some people who are chewing on the idea of, well, if I just isolate his off the bench statistics only, it's not quite as good as Malik Monk. So, uh, you know, and honestly, uh, that doesn't really inspire me as far as a, a narrative or a case, but uh, I can tell you people are going to do it. I, uh, I think... Um, I don't understand why at all why Monk's price is firming today. Do you get that? Uh, I mean, there was an NBA.com article where there were five people uh, who gave out their awards picks. Four of them are voters. Um, but I think that some people might not realize that one of them isn't a voter and that person was Monk as well. So of the actual voters, it was two votes for Monk, one for Nasrid and one for Bogdan Bogdanovic. So I don't think that really moves the needle a great deal either way. Um, Zach Lowe on his podcast with Tim Bontemps, they were talking about six man of the year. Zach was pretty um, strong behind behind Reed, saying that he, for him, has taken over the lead um, and is six man of the year today for, for him. And, and Tim Bontemps was... He said that he would vote for Bogdan Bogdanovich, um, who, yeah, those would be my top two as well. Uh, though I don't think, like, don't go and bo back Bogdan Bogdanovich to win sixth man of the year. Even though he's getting some attention, he's, he's not going to win uh, on a team that is a 10 seed um, and well under 500, even though he should get much more of a look um, than he's going to. I think with Rhea, it's very difficult to handicap because, like, if there was a vote held today, I think Monk would win. Uh, and really? I think he would do so... Uh, not super comfortably, but I think he, he would win. But I think that if there is one award that can be swayed by recency bias, particularly because the Wolves are in this fight for the one seed, I think this is it. So Naz's case, it needs to coalesce, you know, in this final week. I think it's good for Naz that the, the kind of voting mechanics have changed, where previously, for those who don't know, your ballots would be due the Monday after the regular season ends on a Sunday. So you basically have like 24 hours there to make up your mind. And now the way it works, because Ernst and Young need more time to figure out the, who's actually eligible for these awards with the 65 game rule, uh, voters are going to get their ballots somewhere between April 16 and 19. And when they get their ballots, they'll all get them at the same time. You'll have 24 hours to vote. So it just pushes it a little bit further back. And when you have a candidate like Reed, whose case is really coalescing in the final week or so of the season, I do think that, I mean, it's marginal, but I do think that stuff helps just to have a little bit more time for it to sink in. I think if if the Wolves beat the Nuggets, uh, which will be 
um, when you're listening, it'll be tonight on national television, Wednesday night. I think if the Wolves win that game, I think I think Nas will win six man of the year. And if they don't, uh, I would make him odds against um, just because it's going to be a bit tougher sledding doing it from the two seed, which they'll very likely be if they lose that game. The one seed with the win, a second win over Denver um, in the past couple of weeks, I think that would just be such a momentum push. And I think it might be enough to get him over the line. Uh, so that's where I am at at the moment. I haven't bet any Monk in the past. Um, yeah, I haven't bet Monk for basically <laughs> forever. Uh, I bet some of him earlier in the season or I'll probably break even or so, but it'll feel like a, a hefty loss if he does win. Uh, but I think the market has this reasonably priced at the moment. Okay. All right. Um, the I you know I I, I always uh, struggle to kind of put my mindset in you know how are voters making their decision, um, and yeah the uh, it it feels weird that in the absence of Monk being available, the Kings are in this free fall. They're falling into you know kind of dangerous territory about even being playoff eligible, uh, and a loss against Oklahoma City would uh, go a long way to actually making that a reality. <laughs> so interesting results coming uh, on Tuesday night. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately this is uh, you know this, this is kind of a big um, you know delta here um, just in terms of player impact and efficiency. Uh, but if you were just looking at like bench counting stats and who was the most effective like it it's pretty clearly monk so you know it's 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 a this is a tricky one and um you know maybe some recent pain from the emmanuel quickly situation last year where people did hold it very clearly against him that he was started too many games and it was the games that he was really shining in uh and if if there are people who just kind of dismiss nasri out of hand because of that factor that could uh knock him down the board a bit yeah, I and mean, we've spoken about it a bit as someone who's very invested in Nas. Um, I'm not that worried about the starts thing. I just think that, one, that's like it's a big part of his case and a part of his narrative, as we've talked about, like the fact that they've been so good without Towns. Two, quickly started 20 games. Not, like Towns is coming back, so Reed is going to start like 13. It's not that many. He's going to come off the bench like 68 times. Uh, I'm just more concerned that, one, Monk was just very entrenched as the guy, and then two people just really wait points per game. And it's like it's 15.4 against 13.6. And Naz is shooting splits and efficiency and overall and his advanced numbers and his defense and his plus minus, everything laps Monk. And the difference is, which makes you feel better about Naz and quickly, is that you know this time the advanced stat or the advanced stat case is on the guy who's competing for a one seed uh, and not the much lower seed like quickly was. And that's Monk's role this time. So I'm hoping that sways a certain voter segment. But I really don't know how this is going to unfold because it's so unprecedented for the heavily odds on favorite to go down with 10 games. Then you've got this challenger who's on the one seed. Uh, And I think on, on merit, like very biased, but you know, if I had a six man of the year ballot, it would be I would vote for Bogdan Bogdanovich one, I'd vote Nazare two, and I'd vote Monk three. Uh, so I do think that Naz has the better case on merit um, than Monk. Uh, I won't be campaigning for Bogdan Bogdanovich as he's got no chance to win, uh, but he should be getting a look as well. And some people are talking about that a bit more. But uh, yeah, I think this is going to go down to the wire, and I think I think it's ultimately going to be pretty close uh, and, and pretty painful for me to uh, to track these votes as they come in. But but so be it. This is the life yeah. we've Right. Weird, uh, weird outlier. Just random trivia for you, because I don't know if you'll get this. Um, player kept, came off the bench in at least sixty-five games. Leads the NBA in points per position. Uh, who, who is it? Mo Wagner. Uh, he currently because he's taken uh, Malik Monk to town with point three points per possession uh, in his bench minutes uh, with seventy-five games coming off the bench so far this year for Orlando. So um, didn't expect that. No, there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bizarre award. Uh, and I hope all I want is for people just not to weigh the starts against Naz because that's just the most ridiculous thing in the world. And if you want to vote for Monk, if Monk beats Naz, I don't think it's like a travesty. I would vote for Monk. I would vote for Naz over Monk. I don't think it'd be a travesty, but it will be a travesty if you exclude Naz because he started games and helped keep the Wolves in the fight for the one seed. All right, let's pivot to another award, uh, a little two-part award on Clutch Player of the Year. Question from uh, at NBA Punter. Uh, can SGA win Clutch Player of the Year? I feel like it's possible voters won't tie themselves to total clutch points and the main metric as the main metric, and we'll go with the eye test on this one, potentially a consolation award for MVP. 
Uh, and the second part of the question, as Phil Foden scores an absolute worldy to tie it up 2-2 in Madrid, can how can Curry lose Clutch Player of the Year outside of a DeRozan buzzer beater? Mm. Well, uh, take on the first one. And I, I think, it, you know, kind of asking a little bit about the systematic nature of Clutch Player of the Year is a really, really fair question. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> Like there is, there's definitely a way that it has been decided upon recently. Um, this is somewhat of a kind of a fluid uh, definition. If you think the uh, definition of MVP is fluid, well, I got I got clutch player of the year for you, um, where you really gotta you know kind of figure out exactly how you want to define this, um, and maybe you pick a player and work or, you know work your narrative around it. And in that regard, if you want to kind of make sure that SGA gets a trophy for being you know your second choice is your MVP, and you elect to give him the clutch trophy then maybe uh but there's gonna have to be a, a pretty decent sized shift in terms of at least what i've read and heard people say who have uh, ballots and i think ultimately um what the way we've continued to look at this throughout the home stretch here where you just sort by um contributions on a either overall or per possession basis in the clutch minutes which is you know kind of clearly defined on the nba's uh stat uh, dashboard um would tell you that this is still curry's to lose and that derozan despite being kind of known as a player you can count on in this you know in in fourth quarters and in particular the bulls being a team that have uh, defied the odds and won more games than you would have ever expected considering their you know their uh, uh metrics they're eking out these games by playing so well in the clutch at least in the minds of a lot of the nba viewing public i i think uh those are your two candidates and for me at least it still ought to be curry as a meaningful favorite i'm looking at minus 160 for him out there right now and considering um in general what he's done in recent weeks and uh, just uh, the uh, the fact that he's done it in so many fewer clutch minutes and is basically at a at a statistical draw in terms of total production with DeRozan, I think that that tilts the uh, um, advantage in his favor for me. Uh, and also, I just in general think uh, you know people giving Curry a nod for the way he was able to basically carry this team to uh, you know four or five games over five hundred, whatever they land. Um, it's amazing. And he's done it with relatively little help and a completely fluid roster and, you know, lineups and, um, you know, his particular play in the clutch has been so outstanding that I think he's uh, ultimately going to be the guy. So, um, yeah, to the second question, how can Curry lose comeback player of the year outside of a DeRozan buzzer beater? I mean, people don't take this award seriously and they just kind of bandwagon on the DeRozan uh, media campaign would be my answer. Yeah, I think DeRozan has such a weird case because his case is like clutch record and plus minus. It's like, it's an advanced stat case for a team that's like 37 and 41. Like how, like, I don't understand how like, he's got a much better clutch plus minus than Stephen Curry. You know who also has a bet, you know who has a better clutch plus minus than DeMar DeRozan? Kobe White and Nikola Vucevic. Like if they have better plus minuses than DeRozan on his own team, uh, I think the fact that Curry is... He's beating DeRozan in total clutch points, playing 139 clutch minutes versus DeRozan at 182. Again, brought this up before, Curry has 31 clutch three-pointers made. Oh the next highest in the entire league is Buddy Heald with 13, and Damian Lillard has 13 as well. Curry's clutch true shooting percentage uh, is 68%. Like, it's completely insane. I think that... To me, like if you're going to make a choice outside of the two favorites, um, it should be Jokic because I think Jokic is just the, the best clutch player. And I think it might have gotten a little bit interesting if he'd made that buzzer beater against the Clippers um, on national TV to, to walk them off as he walked off Golden State. But ultimately, I think we've had enough voters on the record say how important just kind of the volume clutch output and clutch points are and that it's going to be Curry or DeRozan. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it will ultimately be Curry. I don't think this is a lock, though, because of how weird mm -hmm. and abstract an award this is uh, and how it is so down to, I guess, in a way, personal preference, even though I think that people will really be weighted to total clutch points. But ultimately, I think that people are just going to go to this page, which I'm looking at right now on NBA.com, <laughs> that uh, players, clutch, traditional, Per mode is totals, looking at the totals, points, and everything. And I think they're going to see that, you know, Curry right now has more points than DeRozan in way fewer minutes on significantly better efficiency when you mm -hmm. weight the threes. 
And yeah, the Rose and the Bulls are 24 and 15 in the clutch, and the Warriors are 22 and 19. Like, is that really material <laughs> enough to flip everything? I don't think so. Um, so I think that Curry should be the favorite, I, but I, I don't think this is a lot. I think it's like 65 35. Uh, and I would put a line through everyone else, including okay. SGA. Well, ho- hopefully, they are a little bit more. Um... Uh, intellectually curious, and they go and sort by per 100 possess- possessions instead of just by totals. And if you do that, unbelievably, Steph Curry is scoring 60 points per 100 possessions in the clutch. That is yeah. insanity. The current number one, you know, the leader for the entire NBA this season, Luka Doncic, has 44. Uh, per 100 possessions. Steph Curry himself is 40 per 100 possessions over the balance of the season. You're telling me in the clutch he's able to take it to a 20% or excuse me, a, 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 a one third increase uh, on his overall production is absolutely 150%, excuse me, 150% increase on his overall production uh, in the clutch possessions is is absolutely insane. And I, I don't know, never seen anything like it. I hope uh, he gets the recognition he deserves, not just for our, you know my own vets, but just like, this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, if you look at per possession stuff, uh, which I think is the right way to look at it, like Kyrie Irving has a better case than Tomato Rosen. I think Kyrie (laughs) Irving also has like the moment of the season. I think like the, I think about when I think about clutch moments, like the two moments to me that spring to mind most are Curry's three on national TV against Phoenix when the Pajemski pass goes right behind him off the inbound and he kind of wheels it around in one motion and hits the super deep three to beat the Suns. Uh, and then it's the ridiculous uh, Irving left-handed hook um, against uh, against uh, Jokic and the Nuggets. So, uh, look, he's not going to factor into the whole don't go back Curry Irving. Um, I think it's going to be Curry, but there is still some <laughs> potential for weirdness. The way this flips, and it's so stupid, but if, like, DeRozan gets into clutch time against the Pistons at the end of this week and goes for, like, 12 clutch points in a win then that might flip the race, which is so insane that DeRozan going off against the Pistons could flip at an NBA award. But um, I think that is that is in play. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, hopefully voters arrive on uh, Stephen Curry, who I think is the right choice over DeRozan at least. All right. Question three from Anthony Dabundu. Uh, set over-unders for Korea slams for the top men's players, Sinner, Carlos, um, Ben Medvedev, etc. Um, wow, is Ben Ben Shelton? We're throwing him right in there. That, <laughs> he's a fun one, just because the mental exercise of okay. what is a fair for him. Yeah, um, I thought it might have been a typo, and then I realized Ben Shelton. It's just um, he's the uh, next up in the end, next next U.S. Uh, uh, realistic hope uh, for a U.S. men's slam is is surely Ben Shelton, um, and. I would have a fun kind of side conversation with whoever is interested on, well, what is the most likely slam Ben Shelton wins? Is it the U.S. Open or is it Wimbledon? Because his skill set, or is it the Australian Open? Like his skill set kind of tailors more towards, um, you know, the Australian Open and Wimbledon in terms of court speed than the U.S. Open. But U.S., you get the home crowd support, you get the more comfortable surroundings, you get the preferable, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, OOP uh, spots because you are, you know, the next U.S. great hope. So. So, you know, I think uh, Shelton probably most likely to win the U.S. Open of them, but you got to give the Australian Open due consideration. And then after that would be Wimbledon just because it takes longer to learn on grass, but he's got the skill set for it. So I would put Shelton's uh, career slams at about one and a half. Uh, I think he will get one. Whether he gets two is is a def- tougher question. Um, Sinner and Alcaraz are the fun ones here. We have a 10-year peak likely for these two players uh they are at the very very beginning of uh this uh peak i mean this 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 portion of their career this arc um and alcaraz has two slams uh yannick center has one realistically it is fair to expect them to be the two best men's ten you know nominally the best two men's tennis players in the world for the next 10 years uh that means 40 slams probably going to have one of these two go off as your favorite for most of those uh i don't think this is even building this up too much right so uh if you have about uh, say something like a 25 percent chance to win every slam nominally between these two players you're expecting to win about 10 uh i'm gonna dock uh, alcraz a little bit because we're starting to see and we'll get to this in a second uh, he has some physical <laughs> reliability. He's got an injury-prone nature, at least at this portion of his career. Maybe too early to say this, but uh, don't love the elbow stuff that's going on with him right now. 
Um, don't think that his number has been adjusted aggressively enough for the French Open, considering he can't play at Monte Carlo and was there practicing and prepping and was a very late scratch here. Um, and uh, Sinner, on the other hand, could get better than Alcaraz at clay tennis. It's not crazy. Sinner has uh, a more kind of uh, stylistically a- appropriate game for grass, so he could be, you know, take clearly take the crown from Djokovic and be the, uh, you know, next best grass player and um, and always will have a better rating for me than Alcaraz at the uh, at the Australian Open. So I'm going to set Sinners actually at uh, nine and a half and I'm going to dock Alcaraz a, a slam even though he's already got one and I'm going to put Alcaraz at eight and a half uh, for okay. career slams. Wow, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so health dependent, obviously, and the fact that uh, they are going to be going up against each other and also like it's just difficult, like projecting out 10 years in the future when yeah. presumably there will be other players uh, yeah. who emerge. I remember back in the days where like the two best players in the world were like Andy Roddick and Juan Carlos Ferrero. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like, oh, he's Federer. Uh, it's over. He's in the Dahl as well. You guys need yes. to get to win. There's again. definitely there's definitely a chance Darwin Blanche can come a 15 year old US kid could come out of nowhere and put all of these guys to you know, early career retirements. That's entirely possible. But uh, the Medvedev one is the silliest. Are you ready for this? He's got one. I'm going to set his career. His, as currently coached, I'm going to put his career total at one and a half. Wow. I think yeah. that's where we're at with him, mm-hmm. which is not great because he realistically only has a chance on the two hard courts. I don't really give him much of a chance on uh, clay or grass because he is a, a hard court true and true through through and through. Um, but the uh, here's the caveat. You ready? Mm. Um, recently, uh, Djokovic has split up with his longtime coach, Gorn. Ivan Isovich, I believe, yes. is how you pronounce it. Yep. Um, and uh, that pairing led to something like, what, 15-ish Grand Slams uh, as a coach and player combination. And if there is a stylistic match for what Djokovic likes to do that is very similar in the next generation, it's not Alcaraz, it's not Sinner, it's Medvedev. And I think if Medvedev gets on the phone with Ivan Ivan Isovich, and that is the next, you know, that's like a a true pairing that could uh, kind of help elevate his game, particularly at the later stages of slams, um, then I would uh, upgrade uh, Medvedev's one and a half total to something like three and a half. Um, because I think all of a sudden he becomes very likely to win a couple Australian Opens and maybe one more U.S. Open in his uh, at the uh, tail of his peak here. So um, if you're listening, Medvedev, get on the phone with uh, Goran and uh, let's set up a, a, a partnership so that you can kind of get up to the level of the top guys right now. Yeah, Goran Ivanisevic, um, a historic villain in Australian sports history, <laughs> uh, given that in a, in a memory that's like really strangely a scar of my childhood when he in the 2001 Wimbledon beat Pat Rafter in the final 9-7 in the fifth after Pat Rafter um universally beloved Australian athlete he lost the final year before to Pete Sampras in a I mean it was like Sampras it wasn't particularly it never really felt like Rafter had a chance but against even I want to say Rafter was the favorite going into that uh, and it was like he had like a 15-30 look on Ivan Isovich's serve in the fifth set, couldn't get it done, uh, and then Ivan Isovich took the fifth 9-7. Um, so not that anyone has any problem with Ivan Isovich, very much a people's favourite. Um, but, yeah, I do oddly remember that um, in my childhood, Pat Rafter going down in Wimbledon. Um, no, I think that all makes sense. Um, very difficult to project with injuries, particularly with Alcaraz, with what yeah. he's kind of been through already. It's like he shouldn't be, he's like a baby. He shouldn't be having all these injury problems, um, but he is. And obviously he plays a pretty, uh, a style which you would think is fairly torturous on the body, um, just with the way he kind of throws himself around and the court coverage um, and everything. But um, no, I think that that's fair. I would have Sinner the favorite there as well. All right, question from uh, at Prison Mike. When creating a set of power ratings, how do you determine the optimal weighting for recent performance, Drew? Okay, so uh, tricky question because every sport is different and even in some sports, every team is different. And if you decide to do a player level rating, then you're talking about an entire another kind of solutions you know, system. Um, but uh, effectively, introducing any metric into a prediction model the thing you care about the most is how much of the error can we reduce by adding okay you want to you want to say okay in the blind i would have predicted these results the market closed here 
the difference between me and the market is what number one, how how far off am I? And number two, was I directionally correct relative to the result? And then if you take a broader sample and you look at, okay, well, um, this is the the market missed, you know, misses by a couple points on every game. In some cases, a lot of points, right? There's a delta between what is predicted by the efficient market close and what the uh, the actual result of a given uh, sporting event is. Um, and if you think of solving a problem with a model, mathematically, you are trying to come up with a solution space that has a smaller delta than what is observed. And there are lots of ways you can do that. Incorporating recency is absolutely one of those you should consider if, you know, specifically for sports like the NBA, where you have an 82 game season and players do have huge ups and downs, improvements and regressions and injuries, impact performance, and all those sort of things are uh, dynamic over the space of the season. If you just use the same exact rating and you crunch and crunch and crunch, you're going to be late to the party when teams and players are improving and you're going to be betting on teams that have, you know, clear issues that the market knows about and you're ignoring them. So I, I strongly suggest going to the trouble of solving this problem uh, and the way you want to do it is literally okay if i take my ratings for the season and i take my ratings for the last five games 10 games whatever you want to do and you say and i wait i'm, I'm going to let the computer figure out what the weight ought to be to optimize how much better my projections are than the close of the market uh, and if you turns out you can't do that at all then you got to go back to square one and come up with a whole new way to come up with team ratings uh, but that said i think ultimately um you know starting with something like 70 percent of your weight on the you know season long stuff and 30 percent on what you've seen in the last uh five weeks is is a pretty good rule of thumb to start with uh, and then you just gotta turn the knobs until you get uh optimal um uh, you know best fit available uh, with the metrics you're using. Yeah, I think another um, kind of key aspect of how to wait recency is just has something materially changed with the team? Like, for instance, you should wait recency a lot more for uh, the Dallas Mavericks who added PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford at the deadline and now look like a totally different team um, since then compared to what they were in the NHL, uh, the Hurricanes added um, Jake Gensel and uh, my man Kuznetsov, uh, and now they look like a significantly better team, as do the Dallas Stars with Chris Tanev. So I think that that, yeah, that you need to find out a way to wait recency more for teams that have had changes um, to their to their actual makeup. Whereas a team like the Boston Celtics, like, is it really does recency really matter for a team that is like 15 games clear of the one seed? Yeah. No, probably not. Um, probably needs to be weighted more. Um, one, one, uh, one more thought on this. So you can tell me if this is taking it too far for this level of conversation. Uh, realistically, a two, you know, two parameters and rating them is easy, right? That's straightforward. Uh, what is really happening is time decay, right? The further it is in the past, the less it matters, right? And so realistically, you want to figure out the right time decay that correctly kind of captures the change of a team over time. And in the cases you're, you, you can do this exactly what you're saying, where, you know, you're only really considering the last 10 games from the Mavericks. And the data, you know, the, the a regression will tell you that use an aggressive time decay for that team because something has changed. Uh, now you can do that because you know, or you can just let the computer solve that for you. But uh, ultimately, what you're trying to capture is the time decay, um, you know, change, and that that can actually be just fundamentally solved for. Yep. No, that makes sense. Uh, I have a feeling, unfortunately, I'm going to be all in Dallas sports. Well, maybe not unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, I don't like riding with Jason Kidd. I'm fine riding with the Dallas Stars. Um, but yeah, those two are my bigger positions at the moment. All right, question uh, number five from uh, T. Burr at Tommy B. Uh, what's Jay's favorite Michael Caine movie? Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's an easy one, Tom. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. She was only 16 years <laughs> old uh no my favorite michael Caine movie uh i wanted to throw out one that's not uh one of the obvious ones drew um not like a christopher nolan movie uh sure. or the italian job which was the first quote there uh just a random michael Caine movie which i don't think people really would have uh watched is uh it's called the weatherman directed by oh. gore Babinski, who did the pirates of the uh caribbean movies it stars Nicolas Cage, it was in the kind of mid-2000s where Nick Cage was going through this weird phase before he became like a caricature of himself where he's actually doing 
um, like real films where he did adaptation is in a different tier to these other films. Adaptation is a magnificent film. Uh, he did Matchstick Men with Sam Rockwell, which is really good as well. But the one with Michael Caine uh, is called The Weatherman, uh, where uh, it basically Nick Cage plays a weatherman uh, and he's going through all these issues in his life. Michael Caine is his father. It's a really kind of strangely well done, heartfelt film. It's also very funny and Nick Cage kind of playing a uh, deadpan serious role, which is very difficult to reconcile with his like the Wicker Man, um, Bangkok Dangerous. <laughs> but uh, I get a, I really enjoy kind of serious, good Nick Cage um, and it's coupled with serious, good Michael Caine uh, in The Weatherman. So that, that would be my kind of suggestion. Okay. For a two-time Oscar winner Michael Caine. What about yourself? Okay, let me take you back to uh, 1988, and I'm going to go with the more uh, kind of comedy range of uh, Michael Caine and some Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Uh, yeah. That's like exactly in my wheelhouse of like what I like in like a good fun, uh, you know, kind of a, a Friday night type of movie. Uh, I don't need to get too serious. At, uh, and honestly, uh, can't 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 get a better kind of uh, you know pairing between you know two. Very, very uh, funny uh, men between Steve Martin and Michael Caine in that one. And, uh, you know, just al absolutely outstanding plot. Beautiful uh, um, cinematography as well. So uh, give me some Dirty Rotten Scoundrels if I'm going to okay. have one Michael Caine pick. Very fair. Yeah, looking through, he has a very diverse um, filmography. Uh, <laughs> he won an Oscar for the Cider House Rules, which is not a barrel of laughs. Um, and then, yeah, just in all these other... The Quills, the Qu Quiet American is a good film that, again, not super, super uh, barrel of laughsy. Uh, and then all these Christopher Nolan films that he kind of got attached to, uh, the Batman movies, The Prestige, Inception, Interstellar, Tenet, which I think is a terrible film, um, to be honest, <laughs> even though I like everything else that Nolan has done. I think Tenet is like objectively um, awful. Um, he was wasted yeah. in that too. I think I think time was wasted in that. Everything yeah. was wasted. <laughs> Do you like Tenet? No, no. I just am telling you that uh, I they didn't use him enough. Yeah, like, he's, like you, have Michael Caine. Why, why why give him this lousy part? Yeah, I just don't think they used anything right in that that film. Uh, I didn't enjoy it whatsoever. Um, last question, Drew, is from uh, is from producer Adam, uh, who would like me to expand on when I got mugged in Argentina in 2012 or something. Um, so I actually got mugged twice. Uh, the first one, which I made previous reference to in Cordoba, not a great story, just kind of a guy like jumped on me in an alley and I pushed him away and then I ran away and outran him. Um, so it was fine. The second one, though, was in Buenos Aires where uh, sitting down on like a bench off of Avenida de Mayo and a guy comes up to me um, and couldn't really understand in his broken Spanish. And uh, my Spanish is fine, it's functional, but it's really difficult in Argentina because they say everything um, really funny. Uh, and they change the double L sounds to a sh sound. So like calle is cache. Uh, it's very, very difficult, not fair at all. But I understood him enough to say that he was telling me that he had a knife. Um, uh, tengo un uh, cuchillo, a uh, cuchillo, as you'd say in Argentina. Uh, and I was just like... Uh, I don't think you do because if you had a knife, you'd just show it to me. Like who says who says they have a knife? Uh, you it's something that you very much show. And so I was like, yeah, I don't look. If you've got a knife, I'll I'll give you everything you want, but I don't don't think you do. Uh, and then it kind of rattled him that I just wasn't complying, and then he ran away. Um, so it was really it's a it's a bottom ten attempted robbery uh, in the history of mankind um, to tell someone you don't have a knife. Not have the knife uh, and then and then run away. Um, anyway, I don't want to give people a bad idea of Argentina. I had a wonderful time outside of my two attempted robberies. But uh, have you ever been robbed, Drew? No, 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 no. I'm a physically <laughs> imposing specimen, man. Nobody, uh, yeah. nobody, nobody gives it. Yeah, I got Sorry. the uh, I got the swimmer's shoulders, man. It, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know Drew's actually um, six seven, and if you're the next Andre Iguodala, he actually towers over um, Iggy, uh, as he's yeah. done many times. Yeah. I haven't gotten into a fight since I was like eighteen, I think, and uh, I'm good at diffusing situations like that. But uh, yeah, well, thankfully, never been violently accosted. True, lover, not a fighter. That's um, right. Speaking of uh, a team that's got no fight in it whatsoever, uh, Manchester United this Saturday, the Premier League continued by <laughs> NBC when Bruno Fernandes and Man U look to keep pace in the top half of the table when they face Bournemouth. The match starts at 12.30pm Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. 
Uh, as looks like, speaking of soccer, these two Champions League games have concluded with both draws, two all Arsenal Bayern, three all Madrid City. Um, as someone who needs City to progress, um, that was a, a wild, wild game. Happy to get the point in the end and just kind of get out alive after it was looking pretty grim at 2-1. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about that at a later time. For now, Stanley Cup champion market drew. Um, so I think I was talking to you about this the other day where I think that hockey is um, the most exhilarating betting sport in the world just because there's something about just the amount of goals being scored, just being, it's like a yeah Goldilocks thing of, yeah, it's not too hot, not too cold. There's not too many goals, but there's not too few goals. Just like the scoring distribution is perfect. I like the fact that, yeah, you're going to see five or six goals over the course of 60 minutes of game time. Um where there's enough tension that goals can just be scored. Uh, you know, you can be defending in your zone and then all of a sudden, two seconds later, you just have a clean breakaway one-on-one. Um, and cheering on the Florida Panthers last year in, was one of the best betting experiences of my life as they just kept on scoring these <laughs> over Matthew Kachuk, just kept on scoring these walk-off winners. Um, it was very exciting. But as we talk about the Stanley Cup, champion market i know you're an oilers man um how are you feeling about that um and any other thoughts broadly on this market before i give you mine i don't disagree with you about the betting exhilaration of nhl but i will tell you that um it feels like very much feels like gambling (laughs) and less like handicapping (laughs) and no better example than when we get to the nhl playoffs we had two one seeds go down last year with the Boston Bruins losing to the uh, Florida Panthers 4 3 yes. and the uh, Colorado Avalanche losing to the uh, recently formed Seattle Kraken. Yeah. Uh, like, like the fact that you have one seeds losing regularly in the Stanley Cup playoffs is crazy to me. Um, it's not as crazy as playing, I don't know, 162 game season and then having your one seeds get swept, but it's still crazy. And honestly, like goalie gets hot, uh, you know, team kind of loses a little bit of their momentum on the power play, like weird small stuff, like really, really can influence the teams at the top. And so uh, I don't mind kind of getting involved with the price if the, you know, if the price is right. Um, I know the math answers are probably pretty straightforward this year where you have a, you know, a pretty lopsided, um, you know, conference strength, right? The East uh, we're saying is, um, you know, Eastern Conference is meaningfully weaker than the West as it currently is, you know, the playoff picture is constituted. Um, not that that has ever really mattered <laughs> because plenty of lopsided conference one seeds have gone down. Um, but ultimately, I, I would say that, uh, um, you know, other than being, you know, cheering for a Canadian team, I feel pretty good. Uh, because and not 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 cheering for the Canadians because I don't want them to win, but just because they never seem to do it um, is a little bit concerning. Otherwise, I think st- skill, strength, you know, f- the way that everybody's playing and and just cohesion. Uh, the Oilers, uh, I'm I'm happy uh, holding my position there, but um, yeah, kind of looking sideways at the likes of uh, you know the you know pr- the your team, your your Dallas Stars uh, are spooky, and and certainly the Golden Knights, who we saw get the better of the Oilers in uh, in Vegas a couple months ago, um, definitely look uh, like real deal contenders. Don't really know what to make of the Avalanche. Yeah, the Avs are a bit of a strange team because they're extremely top heavy, uh, and I would say someone who uh, one of maybe the highest leverage individual game for me in a long time was Dallas playing Colorado because I have a big position on the Stars to win the division. And so when they played on what Sunday night, just cheering against Nathan McKinnon it just isn't fun at all. Like he's so good, it's ridiculous. Just him with the pucks, like every time, just close your eyes and hope not for death. Um, but eventually the Stars they got a little bit lucky. There's this double minor uh, and that shaped the game, and then they held on and got the win, which I was very um, happy about. But no, they're, the the abs are scary. It's just very top heavy. Miko Ranton and is hurt at the moment. Doesn't look serious. They also have their goalie situation isn't great, which is a little bit of a concern as you head into the playoffs. Um, Georgiev has not not got the yips, but um, keeps on shipping massive amounts of goals, um, which is not ideal. I think, yeah, I, I definitely agree that there is uh certainly more of an element of chance and luck um in the nhl playoffs than there are in the nba playoffs like the celtics you know they're probably not going to play chicago or atlanta in round one but if they do they're going to be like what like minus three thousand favorites <laughs> to win that series like you're not yeah. going to ever get that in hockey you might get um 
I mean, this year, probably not unless you get like the, if it was the Hurricanes who were going to play like the Capitals or something, then the Hurricanes might be like minus 550 to win that series or something. But it looks like probably not going to get that. And it's good. All these series are going to be, you know, not super, super close. Like you'll have some minus 200 favorites, but it's not going to be super lopsided if the last two teams into the East are the Islanders and the Penguins, when for a while it was looking like the Capitals and the Flyers. Um, But still some uncertainty to play out there. I think in terms of just betting into this market now, the most important thing uh, is just how the matchups are going to break. And so kind of to me, the most interesting thing in this market now is just night to night, uh, where are the Vegas Golden Knights going to land um, in the seeding? Because if they have, if they fall into the, if they're in the wild card and they're going to play like Dallas, then all of a sudden the West is just like this absolute nightmare where you're going to have like Stars against Knights, Avs against Jets, the winner of those two series to play each other, um, and then it will really break for Edmonton. Where if Edmonton gets to play the Kings in round one and they get to play the Canucks in round two. That is just such an absolute blessing compared to the Stars who will be the top team in the West uh, most likely uh, and them having to play a path potentially of like Knights, Avs, Oilers. Um, like that's completely insane. Even if the Stars would be favoured in those series, it would be slight uh, and that's just a really difficult path. And then in the East, um, the Rangers now looking like they were going to have a, a tough schedule potentially have to play the lightning in round one now it's looking like the red wings in round one which is pretty favorable and the canes who uh the kind of team i'm on in the east above all else and i think they are the best team in the east and i would still make them favorites to get out of the east with how florida have fallen off like they're now going to have to probably play the islanders or the penguins in round one and they'll be meaningful favorites in those series but uh, it's not the layup that it was going to be against the Flyers um, or the Caps. So, like, at current prices, I don't think there is really a bet to be made. Uh, I would just be paying attention to the Knights, and if the Oilers are going to avoid the Knights in round one and they get the Kings instead, I think very likely if current prices hold, which they probably will because the market isn't moving off of this kind of residual stuff, then I think the Oilers uh, would be the bet. And in the East, I don't think anyone is now super appetizing. Um, if the Hurricanes, if it looks like they're actually going to get the Flyers or the Caps, then it's seven to one. I think there would be some meat on the bone uh, there. Okay. Okay. I took the 2019, 2018, 2019 Stanley Cup playoffs pretty seriously. Tried to price every round and then uh, watched all four one seeds lose, uh, including <laughs> Tampa Bay, who got swept 4 <laughs> 0. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, so this gets chaotic real quick, but uh, that was a tremendous breakdown. And uh, it's got me excited to actually put some pen to paper and actually come up with fares and see if there's uh, a way to help uh, kind of pack. Because, you know, I, I take the NBA playoffs very seriously series betting wise. But, uh, you know, when it comes to game by game, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not blasting into those markets until it's game seven unders. But, um, you know, ultimately it would be fun to have, uh, you know, kind of a parallel exercise going on with the, with the hockey. So, uh, I'm sold. Yep. I think with this, this, it's a, it's a fun market um, because, uh, hockey betting is exhilarating. It's also a fun market because it gets inefficient very quickly. And I think the thing that the market doesn't appropriately capture is just how path in the playoffs can change rapidly. Like the, it's almost like the stars and the Oilers, their cup odds should be shifting each night based off of the Golden Knights and their results, honestly, because the Knights are you know, materially better than the Kings and the Predators who would otherwise be the opponents for those um, teams where like, I think if current prices hold, and I suspect they, they most likely will, if the Golden Knights, um, if they get up to the three in the Pacific and they play the Oilers, then I think the Stars are the bet um, just in this market overall. And if they fall into the wild card and they end up playing Dallas, then I think that the Oilers are the bet um, overall. For me personally, like the two teams that uh, I've been betting for the months, feels like at this point, um, are the Stars in the West and the Hurricanes in the East with some Oilers sprinkled in and then um, a, a lottery ticket on the Jets at a giant price, which I've got no faith in whatsoever. I think they're very likely just going to go down in round one. But um, yeah, if the Jets win the Stanley Cup, um, I may move to Winnipeg, which would be a shocking life decision. <laughs> I feel like I'd 
just have to contribute something to that team if they're actually to do this for me. Um, and I'm not even like thinking about it as a possibility because um, it's such a large amount and I just don't think it's going to happen where I'm just like, no, Stars and Hurricanes, I think they're the two best teams. They have a very good chance, gotten into good numbers. But yeah, if the Jets do, and Winnipeg doesn't sound like a great place to move the family to, but sometimes you've just got to repay um, the chaps if they can get it done. But I don't think they're going to. Uh, all right, we are done. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, typically, uh, Vaughn um, does the show that drops Thursday morning, but I'll be on that show tomorrow as well. So we'll see you then.